All right, welcome to the Latest.com show. I'm Igor Deris, joining me from Toronto, the land of Justin Bieber, Eric Carrier. He's a contributor at Latest.com and a staff writer at Ishi Hawk. Uh, from Pittsburgh, the land of Wiz Khalifa, it's Latest.com staff writer, former military vet Josh Patton. And from New York, the land of the Mets. He's a 24-year veteran of the U.S. State Department and author of Green Met Well. Oh, Josh just dropped out. It's Peter Van Buren. Josh isn't joining us after all. All right, guys. Well, Josh, uh, Peter, I know why you're happy your boss is getting grilled in Capitol Hill today. What do you make of all the political theater in Congress today? And can we finally put Benghazi behind well, us after after this? You know, Hillary, uh, I, I, I obviously I've, I've made my feelings on her uh, – as a candidate and as a future president, clear, but you got to hand it to her. She uh, looks like she's done a, a terrific job on the Hill today. She has deflected any actual criticism that the Republicans found uh, to throw at her, the Repu- and, uh, and she's looked uh, solid. She has uh, presented herself well. She's had a lot of help from the Republicans who can't get themselves organized. They have been... Uh, hyper focused on the wrong questions throughout the day um, and have made her job a lot easier. But um, despite tossing her softballs, I mean, she could have blown it here or there, um, but she didn't. So at this point, absent uh, some kind of uh, way outer worldly thing that we can't actually conceive of anymore, it's really up to uh, between her and, and the presidency. Nothing more than whether the FBI investigation uncovers hey, something. That. Okay, do you think um, we're still going to be talking about Benghazi after all this? Is, I mean, today the hearing's still going on, I think. Can we finally put this behind us? Well, I, I think the Republicans will keep trying. I mean, they've got not much else to work with other than Benghazi and the emails, it seems. Um, they, they continue to ignore the bigger picture in, in Libya. Hillary was a huge proponent of the American intervention in 2011, which um, pushed Gaddafi out of uh, power but left a vacuum that was filled with chaos that led to Benghazi. Um, But more importantly, today continues to feed terrorism into North Africa. Um, She's never been called to task on her actions there. And the Republicans who could have used today as a way, uh, a forum, to poke at her a little bit, at least bring the topic up, um, have chosen so far not to do that. Um, Benghazi will be with us, but I really can't anticipate that there's much left to talk about. Um, As I said a moment ago, Hillary has done a terrific job uh, pushing the questions aside. Well, good news Welcome, for Madam President. Yeah, and good news for Hillary this week. Joe Biden dropped out of the race. Peter, how much do you think this is going to help her? Um, as much as it possibly could. Look, as a candidate, Biden, (coughs) excuse me, um, speaking nice things about Hillary caused me to to suddenly get ill there. I I apologize. But, uh, you know, Biden was her only real uh, competition on the Democratic side and about 90 percent of her competition overall, given how disorganized the uh, the Republicans are. Um, Biden could have possibly won the nomination uh, from her. And by him stepping out of the race, all of the people that had been kind of standing on the sidelines are now going in for for Hillary. Um, It's as big a gift as she could have expected. And the fact that the Republicans have taken Benghazi as an issue and muddled it even further, man, this is a great week for Hillary. Eric, what do you think? Do, do you think that Biden not, not running actually helps her? Or, you know, was it going to be a two-way race between her and Sanders anyway? I don't think Sanders is out of it yet. He's a different candidate, and he appeals to a different target. Um, speaking of Hillary, I mean, most Americans were tired of hearing about Benghazi. Most Americans are tired about hearing about her emails, and that was reflected in several polls. I think there was one today. I think it was like eight in ten Americans are tired of it. Um, most people have already moved on. The Republicans were just dragging a dead horse because, they, like Peter was saying, they have nothing this election. There isn't really any juicy details besides the email scandal where my dog is biting my feet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think Hillary performed well. I think Sanders is still a candidate. I think Biden leaving the race does help Hillary more than it helps Sanders. 
But Sanders has all been always about slow momentum and building up his campaign over time. It's not something that he's doing overnight. He doesn't have the name recognition that, let's say, Hillary Clinton has. Right. Well, you know, I mean, Republicans like to use the Benghazi keyword. Right now, they've pounced on the fact that Bernie defended that he's a socialist at the last Democratic debate. I saw a poll that said 47 percent, only 47 percent of Americans would vote for a socialist compared to, and that's less than an atheist president, a gay president, anything. Do you think that a socialist can win presidency in a country where socialism is a four-letter word? Eric? Um, I think I think so, because the, the Cold War is over now. The whole idea that red is bad and communism is something that we have to fear has been dispelled. Sure, Bernie Sanders is a socialist, but I think the socialism that he preaches is a new modern kind. It would be more of a progressive liberalism, which is something that most Western societies should push anyways. Living in the old system where, you know, the American dream and that whole mentality, it doesn't function anymore, unfortunately. And it's time that we give the citizens paid maternity leave. We provide health services. Those things shouldn't be scary words. I live in Canada where we have national health care. And if you asked anybody if they would prefer a system where it's private, they absolutely wouldn't. Do you have to wait a little longer sometimes? Sure. But it's better than paying thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for a procedure that you get for free. Well, Peter, I mean, do you think that a socialist can resonate with the majority of Americans despite, you know, the label that he's put on himself? I think that, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders is uh, what people might call a, a, an issue candidate. I, I don't know that he has a significant chance of taking the nomination away from Hillary, especially uh, after this week. And I can't imagine him in a, a general campaign surviving the, the media, surviving the, the, the spotlights uh, the way he does. Though certainly a Sanders-Trump campaign would be hilarious and, uh, and a great boon to any of us who write about uh, politics. N nonetheless, I think Sanders is using this as a terrific opportunity to put some of these so-called socialist ideas out in front of a national audience. He's never had this opportunity before. Um, you know, the label socialist, is, as uh, Eric correctly pointed out, it really has, has gotten muddled. Um, Sanders is a, is a classic liberal uh, progressive. Um, I think sometimes he likes to use the label socialist as kind of a, a bit of a shock tactic, uh, if you will. But, you know, if and when <coughs> excuse me, the time comes, that can be turned against him, absolutely. But I don't think that's going to be necessary. I mean, Hillary is in such a position of strength right now that she is going to continue to basically ignore Sanders. Um, you, we saw in the debate, for example, how she ignored the, the uh, other three candidates near, nearly completely, uh, Lincoln Chaffee and Martin O'Malley. So and, does the and, rest uh, of the country. Jim. And so does the rest of the country. But, I mean, she didn't even debate them or, or question them or interact with them. I mean, they weren't even there as far as she's concerned. And I suspect she's going to take that stance increasingly with Bernie Sanders uh, in the hopes that, you know, his campaign will quietly slip uh, slip away. Right. Well, on the other well, side, an interesting I'm sorry, point, yeah, if I can cut in. I was going to say, I heard an interesting quote a while back whenever Hillary Clinton started taking stances on issues that Bernie Sanders got Hillary Clinton becoming liberal again because for so long Hillary would just stay on the wayside. She was flippy, floppy. But now she actually takes a stance on something, which is interesting because it's got her actually being active. Sure. And by an issues candidate, uh, that's the kind of thing I, I was talking about. I mean, he, he can influence the debate. He can bring these ideas up. He can nudge Hillary in a, in a particular direction, maybe even nudge the, the Republicans in some way. Um, and in that sense, he's playing a very valuable role. But in terms of a path between now and the White House for Bernie Sanders, it's pretty difficult to see that. And if something were to happen, that caused Hillary to implode. And again, I'm not really sure what that could even be at this point. But I mean, for lack of uh, an argument, let's say, uh, God forbid, she has a, a stroke or a heart attack. Um, I doubt that Bernie would be alone in, in the race. I think at that point, you'd see the, the second uh, tier Democrats uh, step into it, possibly, you know, Elizabeth Warren or Kristen Gillibrand. I mean, they may even drag Biden back. Uh, from the dead and put him in there. I doubt the Democratic Party would go forward with Bernie Sanders uh, alone. 
On the other side, the Hill reports that Trump has now been on top of the Republican polls for almost 100 days now. And on Fox, you know, you have guys like Chris Wallace and Brit Hume accepting the fact that he might actually be the Republican nominee. Have we, Peter, have we underestimated this guy? Can he actually make a run for it and not fall apart like, let's say, a Herman Cain or Michelle Bachman? Well, you know, the field on the Republican side is, is very, very weak. And in that kind of an environment, I guess the, the least weak candidate may, in fact, uh, find a way to, to come out uh, on top, at least for a period of time. I mean, Carson is a very niche candidate. His uh, overt Christianity plays well in some Republican circles, but will wither and die in any kind of uh, general uh, situation. Um, the other folks, we haven't really heard much of them. Jeb Bush keeps sticking his foot in his mouth, um, and he's still babbling about 9-11 and things like that. I mean, you want to talk about getting tired of Benghazi. Uh, I think <laughs> we're pretty tired of uh, rehashing the uh, first, or actually the second Bush administration. <coughs> Carla Fioroni, I mean, nobody's heard from her in a while, and the rest of the folks, the same, the same thing. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> So at this point, okay. you're kind of left with Trump. Um, I, I just can't see him succeeding. I mean, he hasn't even hit peak Trump yet. Um, he, he's still sort of a comic character. He sort of blathers about this or, or that. But at some point, um, he's going to have to start getting pinned down on, on serious issues and get away from the, the, the saber rattling and the weird bizarro racist statements that he, he's made. Again, that will play in a general election. And it's possible to see one of maybe Rubio push uh, to the front. Or again, somebody from the Republican bench, it's hard to come up with a name right now, that might see an opportunity and, and, and uh, push him or herself forward. Well, between how weak the field is, and I mean, you saw how hard it was for the Republicans and still is to figure out who their new speaker is going to be. What does this, I mean, let's say you have a Donald Trump candidacy, you have a Paul Ryan speakership after this, this muddled fight in the Congress. What does this mean for the future of the Republican Party? Is this going to be, is it going to splinter off into two parties with the far right conservatives and the establishment guys? Pete? Um, you know, I, I think I'm much more worried about what it says about the future of the United States. Because uh, a Paul Ryan uh, speaker with perhaps a Republican majority coming out of the election in Congress and, and the, the way that Hillary uh, brings such polarization to everything, I mean, it's going to mean another four or eight years of very little getting done. The Republican Party has faced this dilemma now for uh, quite some time. They kind of futzed it and got away with it a little bit with uh, George W. Bush uh, First, he stole the first election uh, in 2000, and, and uh, in 2000, and then in 2004, he essentially sort of stole it again by by, by the media picking up on the whole swift voting of, of John Kerry. And not that Kerry was a particularly strong candidate uh, anyway, um, and some of the war fever there. So the Republicans kind of got a pass on it. But since then, they have in fact created this sort of uh, forum for nutcases. Um, which tends to work out well for them in, in their own primaries, where guns, gays, and abortion are, are really the only issues that voters seem to care about. And then they hit the general election, and people kind of look at them like, you know, the, the drunk uncle who, who, who shut up at, at Thanksgiving. Um, the Republican Party is in danger of simply eating itself. Um, and if they ever faced serious competition, um, on the local levels, they would be in real, real trouble. They managed to hold it together because, you know, the representative from 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 Hickistan, uh, Kansas, you know, can get away with running on guns uh, and abortion. Um, but on a national level, they got nothing, and they uh, will either implode um, or they'll kind of figure out what they need to do here. Um, I'm kind of favoring the imploding side uh, right now, at least for the, the short to midterm. Well, Eric, you're a big poll guy. I you know, forget about the future. Right now, can the Republicans win a national election? I mean, you saw Romney just down in a huge electoral landslide. McCain, same thing. Can the Republicans actually win a national election anymore? Apparently not. Who would, um, be, the, you know, who would be the candidate coming out of it in this scenario, let's say? Oh, from, I mean, it appears it's that it's a two-man race between Trump and Carson at the moment. 
Right. So uh, if yeah, had, I mean, if we had a Trump, oh, well, I was going to say, if we had a Trump versus Clinton, as much as Clinton's a better candidate, if Trump can capitalize on the popular topics, say the right things, and kiss more babies, there is a chance that he could just win the whole conservative vote and some fringe voters. It's just with Trump, it's like, you know, people want to vote him because can it get worse with Clinton who may do nothing? Maybe Trump will be different. You know, that's the kind of mantra he's kind of flowing with is that he's not going to be a status quo politician. He's going to try to do things differently, whether he actually has a plan. He probably doesn't, but that's what he's yeah. running on. And people may be dumb enough to think it's true. But, you know, you look at the, at the math of it, um, you know, Hillary is going to more likely than not, she's going to win California. She's going to win New York. Um, those are huge states voting-wise. She's going to take uh, the Northeast uh, um, once Bernie Sanders has, has done his uh, bit and, and disappears. Mm-hmm. Um, Trump, of course, will, will sweep Texas. Uh, I don't think Hillary's even going to campaign <laughs> down there. I mean, it would really be a waste of gas to even fly down there. But, you know, the, the liberal... The liberal and the middle people are going to be terrified of, of Trump when it, if it actually comes down to that. You've got uh, battleground states of uh, Illinois, Ohio, and, and Virginia. I'm going to step out here and predict that Hillary's running mate is going to be Terry McAuliffe, who's currently the governor of, of Virginia. Um, she and Bill helped put him into that job. He's a long-term Clinton uh, person. And Virginia is a critical state. It is, it, uh, like uh, Illinois, it, it's really two states. It's a minor, it's physically a small area that is very uh, democratic and, and generally liberal. Um, and then a physically large area that's filled with uh, a lot of uh, redneck voters, if, if you will. Same as Illinois. You know, in Illinois, she's got Rahm Emanuel uh, running Chicago, who's going to deliver the votes, uh, living or dead, uh, in the great uh, Chicago tradition. Um, and then if McAuliffe is her vice president or even in a serious position, he's going to deliver uh, Northern Virginia and its votes to her. At that point, you're really looking at Ohio and Florida as kind of critical turning points. I mean, nobody really cares in a presidential election what happens in Louisiana or North Dakota. Um, and so those are those are tough ones. Ohio could go either way. Um, Florida, very likely to go Republican, but I just can't see that uh, Trump, any Republican, is going to be able to, to push Hillary aside. And I need to go on the record and say I say that as someone that really would rather give up a kidney than live under a uh, Hillary Clinton administration. Well, who is the Republican that can come up, come from behind and beat Trump? I mean, we talk Bush. It's, it, it's looking less and less like it's going to be Bush. A lot of people are saying Rubio, but he's, his numbers haven't really budged the entire time, and he's pretty much dead in the polls at the moment. Who is the Republican that's going to come out and beat Trump? Because we, we can all scoff and laugh at the idea of a Trump nomination, but no every month he's still at the top of the polls, and it's looking more and more likely. And not even just at the top of the polls, but at the top of the polls after saying some of the most controversial things we've heard in well, Maybe days. because of. Maybe, right? He, he just he knows how to galvanize the people, which is scary because his ideas are shallow. Well, Eric, you guys just survived a grueling 11-week election up in Canada. You got your first prime minister in 10 years, a liberal. Uh, Justin Trudeau says he's already you know, planning on legalizing marijuana, pulling Canada out of the uh, fight against ISIS. How else is Canada going to be different now with Stephen Harper again? I think it's, I, it's tough to say because, you know, people promise things on the campaign trail, but whether they follow through or not is a different story. Uh, with Trudeau, I think... He's kind of living in his father's legacy, uh, the former Prime Minister Pierre Le Trudeau. He wants to be that Prime Minister that accomplishes things. He wants to try to get things done. Whether or not he will is the question. Uh, I think marijuana will be legalized pretty quickly. He says he plans to do it, but whether he can get it through shouldn't be an issue. Most Canadians are in favor of it, and let's be honest, most people in North America do smoke marijuana as it is. Uh, He cites Colorado as a prime example of why it can be a success. So that's great. Pulling out of the Middle East, that's fine. I mean... Let's be honest, there is no need to be there in a large scale, as much as the United States always wants to drone on about it. Um, it's it's a pointless battle at this point, and I think we're just throwing away lives and dollars that could be better spent on social programs like healthcare for the United States, 
like how about improving poverty, um, you know, food situation for poor families, education reform, all things that Bernie Sanders is talking about, but uh, maybe none of the other candidates. Uh, so in terms of what Trudeau is going to accomplish, I, I hope he can live up to his promises. I think he's an interesting candidate. Um, Harper was bad because he just for too long was a status quo politician, didn't try to accomplish anything. Mal Claire promised a little too much and was a little shady. And beyond that, there really were no other candidates because the Green Party is not overly relevant and the Bloc Québécois has no support outside of Quebec. Peter, we've already seen five states legalize marijuana. If Canada as a whole country legalize it, do you see some of that spilling over to the U.S. and maybe influencing U.S. drug policy? One can hope. Um, unfortunately, the sanity uh, flow out of Canada isn't as much as I think we, we all would like to see. Um, you know, I, I, if Eric wanted to somehow legally adopt me, um, I, I would really kind of, you know, be happy to move up to Canada and, uh, and continue my life uh, as, as an alien there. Uh, you know, the, the marijuana thing is just another example of, of this bizarre, weird pseudo-Puritanism, I think, that, that America clings to for political reasons. You know, the, the Republicans and, and a lot of Democrats as well have convinced all the old people in the United States, you know, that marijuana is the gateway drug to ISIS or something. And despite the fact that so many people are, are actually using marijuana safely, uh, either illegally or in a few states legally, doesn't seem to ever get into the argument. So if we legalize marijuana, people are going to smoke marijuana. Well, they already are smoking marijuana. You know, they're just doing it I illegally. I suspect that the solution more of America will end up choosing is going to be, you know, medical marijuana with big quotes uh, around it, uh, such as what California is doing, where you can essentially go and get a medical marijuana card fairly easily. Um, and then you can, you know, smoke all the mar marijuana you really want. Um, that seems like a, a path that's palatable to more Americans than, than Colorado-style legalization. Um, we're also seeing a few uh, moves towards so-called decriminalization. Uh, technically speaking, here in New York City, if you've got a small amount of marijuana and you're not selling it to someone, you're not giving it to children and things like that, uh, the police are supposed to only give you uh, a traffic ticket, if, if even that. Now, it doesn't work, of course, because if you're uh, African-American, they beat the crap out of you for the same reason. But that, I don't think that's going to change regardless of the laws. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully America will gain a little sense on some topics. Um, and marijuana seems like an easy one for us to uh, just push aside so much silliness, the, the, the jamming up of our legal system. Uh, our court system, the, the idea that we spend so many law enforcement uh, resources uh, chasing down people for using recreational amounts of, of marijuana. I mean, I'm incredibly drunk right now, uh, and it doesn't seem to, to matter. I mean, the, the idea that I can be drink as much as I want to the point where I endanger myself, others, what have you. I mean, basically, as long as I don't get behind the wheel of a car... Um, or, or urinate on the sidewalk, nobody seems to particularly care uh, about that. And, and the discrepancy between drugs like alcohol and drugs like marijuana, hopefully, particularly as, as younger people move up uh, into political ranks, hopefully that will catch on. We'll see. Well, on the other complete other end of the spectrum, uh, Richard Branson posted a document this week that the U.N. plans to call on world leaders to decriminalize all drugs. Um, to reduce uh, prison overcrowding and provide people the help they need instead of, you know, jailing them. Do you think this is reasonable? Do you think that the U.N. will actually get governments to decriminalize all drugs, Peter? No. Um, and and I, I think, you know, this is one of those things that people like Richard Branson, you know, they use this as an opportunity to get an idea out there, and then they propose something big and radical, so people well, talk about it. Richard Branson. I mean, this, this is the UN Office of Drug Policy. Yeah, um, you know, they, they get it out there, they get people talking about it, and they hope that not. While well, they don't expect every country to take a hundred percent, maybe they can get some countries to take eighty, some countries to take fifty. You know, buy into it in different ways. A uh, caution that this will act in exactly the wrong way inside the United States, because if there's anything America doesn't like, it's foreigners telling us how to run our lives, um, and especially foreigners like the U.N. 
So I suspect that this will not help the debate in the United States. It'll just give the anti-marijuana people another thing to, uh, to, to point out that, you know, well, drugs are being, the foreigners are telling us to take drugs here in America. It's part of a new uh, takeover plan. Well, Eric, you guys are planning on legalizing marijuana. Why not, maybe not legalize, but decriminalize the rest of the drugs? I mean, it's, it's a logical argument. It just, it depends how you classify certain other drugs and how dangerous they are, if they are dangerous. Um, you started marijuana yet? Do you stop or do you keep going? Sorry for my dog howling in the background. But uh, I don't know. It's 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 a question. Usually I'm, you know, stop at marijuana, start with that. Let's, you know, analyze the results, see how it goes. And then from there, maybe you progress into something else. I guess the idea, though, is that the government would fear then that our society would break down and become, you know, drug addicted degenerates and stuff. But I don't know. Is it, is it the right answer? It's well, you one. mentioned that other drugs are more dangerous. The point of what the UN is trying to say isn't that, that they're not, is that we should get these people, you know, into rehab, into health facilities rather than putting them in a prison. Sure. I mean, we've seen some. And I guess the yeah. problem with that is that we, we lack the appropriate rehab resources on a large scale to process all those people. That, that is a good point that we should be rehabbing them. And I absolutely agree. But do we have the resources to do that? No, we have trouble. There's a, especially in the United States, there's, we have this issue with rehabbing people. We always think that the best way to fix somebody is to punish them. And this happens, you know, you can tap into the school shooting things where we think that, you know, we should punish these people, put them in jail, but maybe these people needed some kind of help beforehand, psychiatrist or somebody to talk to, right? Same thing with the drugs. It's better to rehab somebody, but we see that as like a, a weak option. I don't know if it taps into the, the idea of manlyhood or something that rehab is for the weak. But yeah, it's absolutely a resource that we need to develop if we want to legalize drugs on a large scale. Well, Peter, I mean, forget decriminalization for a second. How about just the way that we address drug crimes in this country? I mean, we spend so much. We have two and a half million people in jail, a huge majority of them are on nonviolent drug crimes. Shouldn't we reallocate some resources? And as Eric said, we don't have enough. Shouldn't we reallocate and create more of these rehab facilities, mental health facilities? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you look at the system here in the United States, and it's very difficult to conclude that it's accomplishing anything close to, to the so-called goals. I mean, the theory of law enforcement is that you will have people follow the law, and our society will be better because we're not running around uh, committing crimes uh, against each other. Well, the United States has the largest prison population in the world. We spend the most money on it, and it is the most violent prison system that, that I'm aware of anywhere in the world. I mean, basically, if all the people in prison in the United States were a city, it would be the largest city in, in America, certainly the, mo the most violent. So it's very hard to argue that whatever we're doing is accomplishing anything close to, to the goals that we say uh, it, it's supposed to. I mean, it just isn't, isn't working. And so when that happens, you start to look for other options. One option absolutely is to have a parallel program of rehab and a parallel program of uh, mental health care and some kind of thing along the line of, of sort of enhanced social work, I, I guess would be the case. Um, uh, my daughter teaches uh, school in an uh, impoverished uh, area of New York City here, and she's teaching kids who are, who are, you know, 10, 12 years old who have no idea how to live, a, forgive me for the words, but I mean a normal life. They have been raised in, in such difficult circumstances where their role models are people who go to jail, who sell drugs, who, who do who commit crimes around them, their neighborhoods are like that. They, they really don't have a sense of how to live a normal life, and most of them end up in contact with law enforcement. Um, <coughs> in addition to making sure they don't become drug users, we, we need to have a path for them that says, here's how life can work for you if, if you play, uh, play along. Um, we essentially dump that onto the school teachers and say, oh, by the way, you know, in addition to teaching uh, Shakespeare and, uh, you know, the causes of the Civil War, try to tell them how to live their life uh, in, in, a, in a way that uh, fits in with society. I mean, it's impractical. You go to jail, you come out of jail, you go back to jail. If I can interject, too, 
we as a society need to be willing to integrate these people by offering them jobs. Right now, so many jobs will not hire you if you have a, a past record. Let's say, you know, you went to jail for small marijuana possession. Well, that pretty much throws you out of becoming a teacher, throws you out of ever getting into law enforcement. You can't do any of those jobs anymore. And that's such a minor charge to drag your life down on. So, I mean, not it's only is the justice system a problem, but we demonize these people when they maybe didn't commit a violent crime. And it's more than just jobs like that. You know, uh, I've written about this. I, I, uh, when I lost my uh, job at the State Department, I worked a number of minimum wage uh, jobs, and all of them did background checks. And we're very clear, if you have a felony conviction, um, you can't lift boxes in, in our stock room. Um, most of them had drug tests as well. And if you tested positive for marijuana or any of the other uh, so-called illegal drugs, you can't sweep the floor in, in, in our building. Uh, and so, as you've pointed out, you are taking essentially millions of people in the United States and making them unemployable and then wondering why they end up going back and, and, and committing crimes. Um, you know, the pattern here is kind of clear and that usually says you want to do something different, but we seem to be unable to, to reach that situa that solution politically. Well, maybe there's just no will. Peter, this week you wrote a piece called Our Prisons Are Us. Uh, what do our prisons say about us as a society? Well, nothing particularly good, I'm afraid. I mean, we've covered a lot of these points here. Our prisons are violent places, and we have inmates committing violence on inmates. We have guards committing violence against uh, the inmates. Uh, you know, these are terribly violent places where we educate our criminals uh, well to be more uh, more criminal, where we allow uh, the gangs to, to run the uh, interior of, of the prisons, um, and we force uh, inmates into these situations where it's either become victims of the gangs or join the gang so that you can uh, use the power of the gang to, to protect yourself. Um, and we don't seem to have a big problem with that as long as, uh, you know, they play within the boundaries of, of uh, what the guards want. Um, there doesn't seem to be much of anything going on inside the prisons to lessen the chance that someone will be a repeat offender. And, in fact, things like we just talked about uh, make it more likely, I think, that people come out uh, offenders. We make it – if there's drugs in our prisons, there's violence in our prisons – um, it's really our society on a, on a frighteningly ramped up level. Um, and if we can't control what goes on inside of a prison or don't want to control it inside a prison, then, I mean, really, what does that say about our commitment to, to any kind of, of reasonable or just society? Well, on a related topic, uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Scalia was talking this week about how, you know, we're might see the end of the death penalty, and that's we're the only industrialized country that still employs that. Eric, do you think that in our lifetime we'll see the end of the death penalty in the U.S.? Does, te does te if Texas disagrees, but everybody agrees, does that count then? Yeah, I'll take forty-nine <laughs> out of fifty. And I think I think it could happen. Yes, I don't. I think Texas will, you know, invoke states' rights, even though the government's cracking down. Then they'll still be, you know, electrocuting people, but. Um, I think we'll see the end of it. I think, and the thing too about it is that killing somebody is the easy way. I guess. <coughs> it's a lot more tougher on a criminal if they know they're going to spend 30 or 40 years rotting in a prison cell in you know, max security with little interaction with people. That's a lot more scary than a quick you know, lethal injection and you're gone. Peter, there's outcry every time you know, another execution comes up. Uh, it seems almost inevitable that at some point we will get rid of the death penalty. How long do you think that will take? I think it's going to take a while because, uh, as Eric correctly pointed out, we seem to want to seek vengeance against our, our, our criminals. And we, we can't really find our way to, to anything less than, than as much vengeance as we can wring out of the, the system. I suspect you're going to see something, however, with the death penalty closer to uh, just decriminalization, uh, if you will, where, you know, states are going to find it harder and harder to, to, to buy the drugs that they need to kill people, where legal challenges are going to become more and more onerous. And, you know, states will keep it on the books and perhaps conduct executions, but in fact, It'll sort of wither on the vine, if you will. I mean, there'll be exceptions everywhere, and certainly 
places like Texas will, will continue to try to push uh, their own agendas on these things. But hopefully, hopefully it will kind of find its natural settlement here and, and will stop killing people, you know, by government order. Well, like we say every week, we don't just kill ourselves, we also like killing other people. And this week, The Intercept released a number of secret documents regarding the U.S. drone program in the Middle East. Uh, among them was the fact that 90% over one over one period of our bombing in Afghanistan, 90% of the people we killed were not our target. I mean, this is some pretty damning evidence. And I'm, I was, you know, when this became a thing, I was like, okay, the drone program is good because this means less military deaths in the, in, uh, the Middle East. On the other hand, it's really created this uh, atmosphere where collateral damage just is uh, another day at the office. And I feel like people on the other side of the world who are guiding these airstrikes really don't care. Is this going to be a turning point in how we handle our drone, our drone program, Peter? I wish it was going to be a turning point, but I'm very afraid that the people in, in charge of these programs are, are simply kind of shrugging their shoulders at this point. I mean, the fact that these documents leaked and, and the rest of us just learned all this today is kind of interesting. But in fact, this is how the United States has been conducting war over the past decade or, or so. We just happened to find out about it. Pardon? Well, I was going to say, historically, I mean, that's how warfare has been conducted since the beginning of time. If you look at World War II, Hiroshima, that decimated the entire city, yeah. right? Yeah, if you look at it's not particularly one, new I mean, for the United. Yeah, it's it's a it's a phenomenon that's existed through all war. It's just now that everything is much more publicized and video is available, and we have better records. It's more visible, but it's always existed. Well, it has, but I think in the recent uh, decades, it's increasingly only the United States who continues to make war in this fashion or encourage our, our allies, if you will, like the Saudis, to do the very same thing in Yemen. This isn't by accident, of course. It's very much policy, and, and it's policy in, in, in a couple of, of ways. The first, of course is that we are sloppy in our targeting and really don't particularly care. Um, a lot of these uh, killings uh, by drone or, or other weapons are, are simply what they call profile killings. Uh, a cell phone that was connected to another cell phone used by a terrorist. Well, probably that's a bad guy holding the phone, so let's just blow up a whole bus full of people and, and hope it was a bad guy in, in, in the bunch. The other thing that's ha that is assured uh, of these kind of uh, extra killings is the type of weapons that are used. I mean, our drones generally fire Hellfire missiles. These were things developed during the Cold War. These missiles were developed to blow up Russian tanks. And so when you're hunting a human being with a weapon that was designed to blow up a tank, you can guarantee that other folks are going to die uh, along the way, even if, and that's a big if, even if you've got the right guy in the sights. Look, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, all the terrible things that happened in World War II, who still is doing that? There's really only two countries in the world that make war on, on this kind of industrial scale. Um, and you're really left with the United States and, to a certain degree, the, the Soviet Union, who insist on, on practicing war in this kind of, of fashion. Um, it's really a, an empire or two out of date, but the United States continues to, to, to do it. It's, it's very shameful. Why do you think we get so upset when, uh, let's say, a country like Russia goes in there and starts bombing ISIS targets? Why are we, you know, we just told Iraq that if they're, they agree to ha have Russia help them, we're not going to help them anymore. Why do we get our panties in a twist over that? Well, because up until the Russians arrived uh, in Syria, there was no one there that would be in any position to tell us what we can and can't do. Um, the other, the people that we were shooting at were largely third world guys, you know, in, in man dresses with, with rusty old machine guns. They were not in a position <laughs> to particularly uh, tell the Americans what we could and couldn't blow up or in any kind of large sense uh, do. Um, obviously, people get killed, but, I mean, it was nothing on the scale that the United States was doing. The Russians showing up changes the game because they are in a position now to act as a kind of uh, 
what's the right word? I mean, block against U.S. intentions. Um, they have, for example, assured that Assad will stay in power as long as the Russians uh, want him to stay in power. They have negated any possibility of a no-fly zone in, in Syria because no-fly zones need to be defended, and the U.S. isn't going to be able to shoot down Russian uh, airplanes. Um, and they have assured themselves of being able to play a decisive role in ISIS's uh, successes and, and ongoing adventures. And if the Russians do find a, a move into uh, Iraq or they work through the Iranians uh, in common cause, then America's flexibility uh, in that beleaguered country also disappears. It's a new game out there. And the problem is, is that America isn't the biggest kid on the block anymore. Well, one last thing I want to talk about, you know, we spent a lot of time, I mean, just everyone in the media spends a lot of time talking about the Middle East, Canada. Here in America, Puerto Rico is currently having one of the worst economic crises that we have ever seen in this country. Along with that, I mean, Bernie Sanders was talking about this week, that the state, uh, Puerto Rico has a higher rate of income inequality than any state in the U.S. Why do we just not care about Puerto Rico, which would be, I think, the 24th or the 23rd biggest state in the country if we actually included it in the union. But we do care about, you know, Oklahoma. Peter? Do Puerto Ricans vote? <laughs> well, you, just national everyone. Everyone. you just stumped uh, everyone. You just stumped everyone. I don't believe. know the answer. No, I'm Canadian. I don't yeah. believe that they um, have electoral votes. I, I don't think so. No, they're a their territory, um, and I think that answers some of the, the, these questions. I mean, it's hard to say it doesn't. Puerto Rico doesn't matter, but in fact, if they do matter, they don't matter much. Um, they they don't have the the, the votes in, in in Congress. They don't uh, have reasons for the federal government to really pay that much attention to what happens uh, do not down there. I just looked it up. I'm sorry. They don't vote. Is that Eric? Did you? Okay. Well, you yeah, just I did some quick that argument. That <laughs> argument just just got finished. Um, you don't vote, then you don't count. Well, that's a very good point. So, I mean, this is a country well, built on I representation, mean, right? One word. But now you're talking about Washington D.C. doesn't have a voting congressman. Uh, Puerto Rico with its three and a half million population doesn't have any representation, really. Not to mention other places like Guam and American Samoa that don't have. Aren't these people going completely? I mean, isn't that un American to let them go unrepresented? Eric? Well, you guys have become the modern British. I mean, it, the way I look at it, there's one very quick word for this, and like it or hate it, it's racism. That's what it comes down to. The American population of what we would call, you know, the landmass of America thinks it's better than its surrounding states. That's what Peter, have to. we come full circle and now we're the racist territory. colonialists? <laughs> um, yeah, I would lean more towards colonial imperialists than, than racism, um, but it all kind of adds up to the same thing, basically. I mean, this is not dissimilar to how the United States treats its other vassal states, um, where they're only really of value. I mean, they're not officially territories, but they're really only valuable to us in the extent that they – uh, provide us with places for military bases or they have resources that we want a piece of or they um, you know, politically look, make us look good by contributing uh, forces to our latest coalition. But otherwise, I mean, we really don't pay any attention to them or care what happens to them. Uh, and I think uh, with our territories, we have territories. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, why are we holding territories anymore? That itself the word itself is like left over from the 19th century. Yeah, those territories, perhaps, though, and we yeah, let them vote. In a, in a word, sort of sums it all up. They're, they're not as good as we are. They're not deserving of the stuff that, uh, that we uh, grant ourselves. Eric, want to you, have over a, them. you have a new liberal government. Can you guys take Puerto Rico and Guam? Sure, why not? As long as they pay their taxes, sounds good. All right, well, there we, have, there we go. On that note, we're going to go sign the papers handing over Guam and Puerto Rico to Canada. We'll see you next week. Peter, Eric, thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Take care. Thanks Keep reading latest.com. <laughs>